Hey. Hello, everybody, to the uh, second class of the second semester. Today we have a really, um, I would say, a, a subject that goes to the heart and mind of the Jewish people. It's a debate that has been going on um, throughout uh, Jewish history and uh, continues through different uh, you know, places, times, and so forth, and communities. But it's the same debate. There's really one debate here. And that debate, do we rely on the Torah for everything, for all knowledge? Or is it something that the Torah just guides us into a process of learning the world. That's really the discussion. And the more ultra-Orthodox you become, this is one-to-one, -one. the more ultra-Orthodox you become, you, of course, go with the, with the former, that it is the Torah is self-sufficient. So you don't need to study math. You don't need to study English. You can continue to speak in your vernacular um, and just rely on the Torah and, and God's uh, grace. So, and the other side, of course, the more reformed you become, um, you become more open to the knowledge of the world and, and incorporated within your world all the time. Um, I'm, you know, I understand both sides. I've lived in communities of both sides. Of course, I am on one side. I definitely believe, like Maimonides, that you can incorporate knowledge from the, uh, from the outside, and you should listen to anybody who has wisdom to share. Um, of course, you have to, before you do that, you have to define the the parameters of your people because beyond that that's a nice idea that's a very clever idea but it's not jewish it cannot come into i cannot incorporate into jewish uh practice so in order to do that and this is what we will be really focusing on today um there was a need over the centuries for judaism to define itself now, Judaism is a way of life. The word religion, uh, denomination, all these things um, came later. The, the Jewish people is basically a community that is trying to uh, define itself as it goes. So there was no constitution for the Jewish people. There was no dogma per se. The Torah is just a guidebook to guide our community how to manage in the world. But when it, Christianity came along and Islam came along, they put a lot of pressures on, on Jews to define themselves because they were very dogmatic. They had very clear boundaries and, and they met so often to redefine it and and to uh, dogmatize it further. But Judaism, really, the first attempt that we see to do that systematically, and not surprisingly, uh, was by Maimonides in the 12th century. Um, Maimonides lived uh, between the years 1135 and 1204. And he, he comes after the Rashi, area, uh, uh, era. And uh, he is in Spain and Cordoba. And then, of course, with the uh, expulsion and the uh, not just, you know, in 1492, but even before that, there were different, um, you know, miscommunications between the, the uh, religions and the faiths in, in Cordoba. And then they had to leave the Jews. So he moved to Egypt. But he became a uh, a physician, so clearly he's in the world of, of sciences. And then 
he is such an amazing person that was able to codify the most important bodies of work of Judaism. So we have to listen to Maimonides, but we don't have to listen to him all the time, all, all the way, so to speak. And, and I'm a Maimonidean, but with a, with a limit. So I'll just, before we get to the video, just show you. Um, so the way he did it, um, was to codify, or not to codify, to, to create the principles, the core, what he saw as should be dogma for the Jewish people. And later on, we'll look at the Siddur, at the prayer book. It's in our prayer, bo prayer book. Um, it became a, uh, a song at the end of uh, our prayer, Yigdal, Yigdal Elohim Chai Ve'ishtabach. That's the 13 principles of uh, Maimonides that he wrote. So these are the principles, and this is the, the idea that we'll talk about. Should you even codify it, uh, put limits on it, um, and so forth? If you do, you become very rational. So the debate is really between rationalism and uh, what we say uh, mysticism, uh, as, as we call it. Okay, um, let's go to. Um, the video, Professor Dr. Um, Alan Middleman. He is a professor of Jewish uh, history. And uh, I had a pleasure of uh, studying some Hebrew session with him, not, not anything uh, further. Sorry. Okay. The Maimonidean controversy refers to a centuries-long argument that began during Maimonides' lifetime and swept through southern France and Spain for a century after his death. It included excommunications, impassioned letters, polemical sermons, booklets, and propaganda, as well as clashes among competing rabbinic authorities. What was the Maimonidean controversy about? Most fundamentally, it was about the place of philosophy, shorthand for rational scientific inquiry in Judaism. Was or is Judaism a rational religion? That is, are there good defensible reasons to hold Jewish religious beliefs? Can the existence of God, for example, be proven? Or is Judaism primarily a commitment based on faith and loyalty to a revered authoritative tradition? Is Judaism a place you go to turn off the endless critical questions that reason produces? And further, is wanting Judaism to pass muster at the bar of reason a chutzpah against God? After all, who are we to tell God what's acceptable to us? It's understandable that highly educated questioning people might be skeptical toward received religious opinion and undecided about fundamental matters, such as whether God exists or whether the Torah is the consummate expression of divine will. Maimonides taught that religion must satisfy sound reason and that reason when exercised properly could overcome doubt. For Maimonides, the ideal Jew should know a lot about natural science and philosophy. Only a well-trained mind could grasp the truths of Judaism. But his opponents didn't want to go down that road. They worried about the risks of too much rational inquiry. They insisted that educating people in a Torah true atmosphere and putting limits on intellectual exploration would keep Jews in the fold. I don't want to imply that Judaism before Maimonides was somehow lacking in reason. The rabbinic Judaism that all parties to the conflict professed 
had its own internal model of rational inquiry, namely the dialectics of the Talmud. The Talmud is all about evidence, argument, criticism, and proof. Miracles make good stories for it, but they don't win legal arguments. Maimonides was a master of this culture. Nonetheless, the rationality that he championed was different. It was more subversive. It derived from the philosophy and science of Aristotle and the medieval Muslim philosophers who followed him. The Aristotelian way of thought, while not atheistic, knew nothing of a personal God, of revelation, or of divine commandments. Talmudic thought was indeed critical, but it was embedded within the highly imaginative poetic theology found in Midrash. God was very much a human-like literary character, both on a straightforward reading of the Bible as well as in rabbinic commentaries. Maimonides left that world behind. He proposed a distant transcendent God stripped of all human seeming attributes, such as emotion or physical features. Maimonides' God could not be characterized by any of the terms of human language, such as great or powerful or compassionate. God was essentially unknowable. This philosophical mode of thought precluded the idea of a comforting, familiar, and personal God. Maimonides' opponents disapproved of this importation of Greek thought into Judaism. To philosophize, they felt, implied that the Torah lacked resources to make its own laws and teachings clear. The Torah is perfect. Why would one need anything else? Now, you might think that the argument over Maimonides' philosophical approach to Judaism was between enlightened people, the Maimonidians, and reactionary traditionalists, the anti-Maimonidians. But the figures who opposed Maimonidian thought, such as Rabbi Avraham ben David of Pasquier, known as Rabad, or Rabbi Shlomo ben Avraham Adret of Barcelona, known as Rashba, they were themselves moderate enlighteners. Although some anti-Maimonidians did oppose philosophy root and branch, others believed that philosophical interpretations of Judaism had merit. They just worried about how far such interpretations should go and who should be permitted to pursue them. So some anti-Maimonidian rabbis endorsed philosophy, but only for an elite few, and only because they worried that if the elite were forbidden from philosophizing, the best minds might be lost to Judaism. Overall, they feared the consequences of philosophy run amok. It might lead to skepticism and non-observance, mockery and communal disintegration. They suspected that Maimonides and his followers did not believe in traditional religious convictions, such as bodily resurrection in the Messianic era, the creation of the world from nothing, or the miracles reported in the Bible. Maimonides' own words gave credence to their suspicions. He tells us that the guide for the perplexed contains a secret teaching only for the initiated. Perhaps his more pious views were mere political rhetoric for the masses. Furthermore, Maimonides' opponents feared that his penchant for viewing some traditional matters as allegory, such as anthropomorphic descriptions of God's body in the Bible, would open the floodgates to lax observance and a diminished assimilated Judaism. These worries were not unfounded. There were popular preachers inspired by philosophical approaches who minimized the need for traditional observance, given supposedly higher rational insights into what the Torah really meant. It is also important to understand that this controversy was not a purely intellectual matter. It quickly became embroiled in politics and class. How far should rabbinic authority go? Proponents of each side banned those on the other, but should bans issued by foreign rabbis apply beyond their borders? How much weight should local practice carry? Was cultural pluralism legitimate in medieval Judaism? 
These issues were deeply implicated in the controversy and are still alive today, evident in the many fundamental ideological and cultural gaps that exist between subcommunities of contemporary Jews, the splits between conservative and orthodox Jews, between modern Orthodox and Haredi Jews, between secular and religious Jews, can all be seen as echoes of these unresolved questions about whether we may apply so-called external wisdom to our understanding of Torah and about who has the authority to make such decisions. Bans and counterbans aside, the most shocking moment in the controversy came in 1233 spurred on by anti-Maimonidians, the church burned the guide for the perplexed, as well as the book of knowledge, the foundational section of Maimonides' code of law, the Mishnah Torah. The intrusion of the church into the controversy brought momentary sobriety and solidarity back to the Jewish disputants. But the controversy broke out anew later in the 13th century, ending only with the expulsion of the Jews from France. The Maimonidian controversy is a rich but painful episode in Jewish history. It gets to the heart of what Judaism is or ought to be. Is Judaism first and foremost a form of fidelity and piety marked by obedience to law and faithfulness to tradition? Is its continued survival based primarily on sentiment and deference to the old and revered? Is Judaism primarily a matter of belonging rather than believing? Or is Judaism a way of life that reveals an ultimate truth about who we are and what our place is in the universe? Is it about our pursuit of intellectual and moral excellence? To put it another way, is Judaism a precious artifact given to us to preserve, or is it a way of life that's open to us to deepen and enrich with the truths of our time? There are representatives of both camps in the Jewish world today. For some, questioning, criticism, and doubt are authentic Jewish virtues. For others, returning to a fully immersive traditional culture looks like salvation. In the broad middle where many of us are, we might find that our own souls are conflicted. On the one hand, we might think that contemporary Maimonidians have the better approach, namely that religion and rational inquiry can and should be embraced simultaneously. We needn't leave our brains at the door to be good Jews, so to speak. On the other hand, we can also appreciate the risks of too much openness. If everything is up for grabs, if nothing is fixed and secure, how can religious commitment survive? What will keep us anchored in Judaism? It's no wonder that the questions raised by the Maimonidian controversy remain open, for their answers are of utmost consequence for how we understand Judaism. Okay. All right. Um, do you have any comments before we go to the uh, first source? If you have, raise your hand or unmute. Okay. Um, we'll start with the first, um, the first source. Okay. Um, we gave it to. Uh, the Chavruta with Devi and uh, right, mm -hmm. yeah. Chavruta. So uh, I'm sorry. I guess that Susan is not here, of course, and uh, Elaine. So if you want to start something, but Anne, do you want to say something mm -hmm. about it? No, I was just giving you who was in that Chavruta. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Devi, would you like to start with reading it and and giving your impressions? Uh, I'm not sure I have a very good impression because it was really hard to understand, but I will definitely read it. Um, um, should I start with the also known as or just start with it should be clearly understood? Well, we'll start from the beginning. You know, the first question is Moses or Aristotle? Was the world created from nothing or is it eternal? And of course, that will um, project itself into the whole discussion. Because if you say that the world has always been, 
it means that there's no change in God. You can't attribute any change or emotional change to God. But if you if you are a rationalist, but you're a Maimonidean, you would say, yes, but the world, um, matter may not change its volume, but um, there was a creation of the world, which means that God somehow could um, uh, modify it, it, himself. And, and by the way, it's the same argument with Christianity, Judaism and Christianity, saying that if God can become a human being, you mean that there was a change in God. So it's the same, same kind of argument. Okay, so of course, those who say that you can incorporate things from the outside would tend to say to go with the world was always created, and those who uh, go by Maimonides tend to be more uh, particularistic about it. Okay, so you can start with number one. It, it should be clearly understood that our reason for rejecting the eternity of the world is not to be sought in any text of the Torah, which says that the world is created. The method of allegorical interpretation is no less possible or permissible in the matter of the world being created than in any other. But we don't explain the text allegorically for two reasons. The eternity of the world is not conclusively proved. It is therefore wrong to reject the text and interpret them allegorically because of preference for a view the opposite of which might be shown to be preferable for a variety of reasons. If we believed in the eternity of the world, according to the principles laid down by Aristotle, that the world exists by necessity, that the nature of no thing ever changes and that nothing ever deviates from its customary behavior, this would destroy the law from its very foundation and belie automatically every miracle and make void all hopes and fears the law seeks to inspire. Okay, we'll, we'll stop here for a second to try to unpack this. This is, of course, very, very loaded. So what basically um, uh, Maimonides is saying here, and it's interesting because he's, this is what brought anger um, on him, um, because he basically said, I reject Aristotle's premise that the world was always there, not because I can prove otherwise, I can prove it, or I can prove otherwise, but you can't prove it. So it really is by kind of elimination. And the people who were angry at Maimonides um, were angry at him for not being more harsher there to say, no, we have evidence, the Torah tells us that the world was created. And, and the, the last verse here that says, you know, the what he says, this was destroyed the law from its very foundation and belie automatically every miracle and make void all hopes and fears the law seeks to inspire, which means that we understand we are uh, human beings with, with inspirations and aspirations. So we always change and we need a method or something that would provide that constant change. So if you say that God is really removable um, or did not create the world, there's no personal God. And that really is at the core of all these arguments. Um, do you, any questions that you had in mind about this text? Oh, Sabrina has a question. Yes, Sabrina. If we, if we take out the idea of the world beginning at a certain point and God being the catalyst for that, doesn't that also affect this whole concept of a relationship with our creator? Of course, absolutely. That's why we believe in miracles, right? Even though Dr. Milliman say, says that the, um, the, they often, the stories about miracles did not win a legal argument in the Talmud but they're inserted all over. They are, they, they do influence our rabbis in their, in their decisions. And, and, you know, we believe in miracles because we believe in the split of the, uh, of the uh, Sea of Reeds. 
Uh, we believe that in, in Revelation and in Sinai. So um, I would say that if you want to really kind of determine where you are on the on the scale that we were talking about, um, think of Sinai, because Sinai is that uh, litmus test. If you believe, you don't have to picture exactly a mount, the, the same mountain and the smoke and the way it was, but do you believe in God's revelation in this world that God can somehow overcome the, the physics of this world? Of course, there's physics and logic, um, but can God overcome that? And if you remember last, last uh, class, we talked about that um, there is no luck to Israel. There's a source in the Talmud says Israel has no luck. But what does that mean? Israel has no luck. It's not that it's not lucky that way. It's just that whatever we think we are lucky in, um, looking at the stars, trying to, to foretell things, God is above that. We don't look at the zodiac and the future and read in tea leaves and all that, what will happen to us. We believe that there's a God who is in charge, who will, if need be, intervene uh, in nature. Not every time, but we do believe that it's possible. So that really, if you're to the right of it or to the left of it, that's really um, that, the, the location. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm certainly to the left of it because I believe that the Torah was written by real people, by men, and not impossible to have a woman's hand in there at some point, but probably not. Um, and it's a very, very powerful and important work that has great meaning for my life. But it's, it's a literary work. It's an ethical work. It's not written by, it's written by human beings. And to me, God is an idea, again, a very powerful idea that and my visioning of that idea comes from things in the Torah. Yeah. I think that's uh, where yeah. I want to stop uh, at this point. <laughs> yeah. So uh, before we get to a Adrian, um, when I moved from Yeshiva University, which is Black Hat Orthodox, to JTS, which is very liberal, that really was the, the middle, Sinai. There was no question yeah. at Yeshiva University yeah. about the, the, uh, the revelation in Sinai. But there was a very serious question about it at, at JTS. So, uh, yeah. Um, Adrian and Miriam, uh, you can unmute yourself. You, you, Rabbi, you said that the God intervenes intermittently. What are the, by, by what, uh, how does he judge that? How does he decide what, what he's going to become involved in? <laughs> that's, ah, that's, that's, a, that's a very, <laughs> that's a very, very good question. And I would answer, you have I would a answer. very, very good answer. Yeah, I do. I, well, I have, I have a, 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 an answer. I don't know if it's the, very, very good. You judge it, but I'll give you um, one example from the Torah that repeats itself in different places. So, of course, from our perspective, the Hebrew scripture, you know, we follow that. And the, there, there are many miracles uh, there with, from the perspective of God intervening to save the Jewish people. That's really where God makes that like a, a parent and a child, you know, a parent will run after the child to, you know, in front of a, a truck. Uh, it's not, not logic, you know, it's not logical, but you have something more powerful. So God protects the, the Jewish people, but also it's not just that, that easy. Um, it, you have to follow God, God's commandments, for God to save you, to pull you, right? You have to, you have to stretch out your arm in that hope for redemption, for 
for to being saved, then God pull you. That's very important. So I'll give you the one example from the Torah, because that's a very good uh, question. I'm, I'm glad that we're dealing with it. Um, when the uh, Midianite wanted to fight militarily against the, uh, the, uh, the Israelites when they were traveling through the desert, um, they couldn't. And Israel was beating every enemy that came uh, to fight it. So the Midianite said, um, let's trick the Israelites and seduce the men, the soldiers. So they'll sin. And basically sin is where God then does not protect, uh, uh, protect the Jewish people. And that's what they did. And they sinned. And then uh, many of them died in that war. And they decided to go and to uh, rebel against it. And God said, don't go because Moses told the people, don't go because the Ark of the Covenant, you can take the Ark of the Covenant, but God is not with you. So don't go. God will not save you because you didn't follow the mitzvot. So um, that's really where, where that usually God intervenes, as we see when the Jewish people follow his commandment. Yeah. Well, uh, continuing with that mm -hmm. idea that the God will jump, like a parent will jump in front of a truck to protect the Jewish people, then where do we put the Holocaust? Right, exactly. Um, that, that is the question that, you know, is very hard to, uh, to, to answer, of course. Um, I usually go by what the, uh, the Lubavitch rabbi said, um, you know, before we ask where God was in the Holocaust, let's ask where man was. So I think, you know, what's happening also in the, in, in Ukraine, in Ukraine um, mm -hmm. you know, where, where is the world? You know, where is the world? I mean, let, let them duke it out. Okay. I mean, that was not even the situation, of course, in the Holocaust, where you took defenseless people. But even here, with their military, with their country, their country is being decimated. There are 10 million people who already uprooted from their home. This is the worst scenario in every human being's mind. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at it. I know we all are trying to do the best we can. But we are limited too. Of course, we are limited. So things like this happen. If we just all dropped what we did and went to Ukraine to defend them, that would have gone, would have ended in two days. But the world doesn't work this way, unfortunately, not, not yet. But that's really, so a lot of times we do have to ask where, where man is uh, before we add where Most human is, before well, we add where, uh, where God was. Right. Yeah. Elaine? Um, it says here <clears throat> that Maimonides was a scholar, a philosopher, a physician, and an astronomer. That was so enough. Opinion. He was a very maven oriented human being. Mm -hmm. Do you think if he were just one of those four, he would have a different mindset? about how one yeah. should behave. If yeah, his vision would have been narrower. Yeah. His vision was just so wide, but not everybody can, not, not everybody has the mind of Maimonides that can expand that much and be good at all these, all these things. I don't know how he had time to do what he did. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah. I, I imagine that being a philosopher, and an astronomer can cause maybe a different answer to what he's writing and what he believes in. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Um, I, I want to, before we go to the second source, by the way, the, the war in Ukraine right now is, is, um, is the one war that exists through different and debates that usually are in different forms. And what we're talking about here is one of those is you can be very um, organized and you control and controlling um, and think that the truth is in, in your hands always, or 
you know, there's the other side that says, no, I don't want to be controlled. I want to think for myself and I'll pay the price for it and I'm willing to die for it. This is exactly the, these, uh, these arguments. And here too, with religious control, the, the, the more you know, to the left you go, you want to have this philosophy. I want to incorporate anything I want into my knowledge and my faith. So, but the danger, of course, and that's what we'll see now with the four uh, responses to, to Maimonides, that he puts people in danger. Because if you're going to go too far and adopt these philosophical views, then we lose Jews that way. And then interfaith marriage and all that that wow. we can get to maybe later. Um, yes, Anne? But he wasn't saying that what he was saying is that you can't say what God is. You can say what God is not. And in the same, in relation to creation, the same thing. You mm -hmm. can't, he has no proof for what Aristotle says. Right. So he has to put that aside. And mm -hmm. there's also no proof for what is written in the Torah. But we can hold, we can hold both of these things in our heads without being bad Jews, really. Right. right. I mean, we hold ideas that are so contradicting to each other in our hand, in my, in our, in our faith, in our mind, um, that this is not that, um, you know, as problematic. But you, you have to think also the context. We today have been so exposed to Western philosophy and teaching and education. Basically, it, it's mostly Western, and we've lived in the Western world um, all our lives. So we're not um, not afraid of it. We're not hesitant to study something new. Um, but you know, the evidence is that a lot of those people are also not as observant Jewishly. So so that's really where they're afraid. They're saying, let's 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 create at least boundaries. And that's what we, how we started this class that then Maimonides had to write the 13 principles to at least give a, um, you know, a body to this amorphic uh, potentially discussion or uh, view. So let's, let's get to the second, um, the second Chavruta with the second source. And yes, if you bring the Sidhu, that will be good. We'll uh, look at it later at Yigdal on page 53. Um, so the second, uh, who's the second Chevruta? That's Alan, Alan, Jonathan. Yes. So I know you didn't have a chance to uh, meet, but did you look at the sources individually? Yeah. Alan, do you want to say something about it? Or actually, um, we should, uh, yeah, maybe one wants to read and one wants to, uh, John, do you want to read it and then and then Alan can comment on it? Uh, sure. <clears throat> um, so this is um, responses to the philosophical works of Maimonides. It's from uh, Shem Tov in Falakera, the uh, epistle of the debate. The scholar said, the scholar said, I shall ask you to make known to me what you see in my ways that you decree to me to be among the rebels. And what okay, you let me, you know what, let me just preface this because this is a, um, there was a, um, he wrote a, uh, an, an epistle um, with kind of a story, a debate between uh, the pietist and the scholar. So the scholar clearly is the philosopher and the pietist is the person that wants to keep the, uh, the, the boundaries uh, tighter. Okay, um, please go ahead. Um, that you de decree uh, me to be among the rebels and what wrong you find in me that you suspect me among the infidels. The pietist replied, far be it from me to tr attribute wrong to your actions and heaven forfend that I should call the perfection of your deeds imperfect. I see you humble and holy without imperfection. You are the disciples of Aaron, pursuing peace and loving peace, loving people and bringing them close to the Torah. You are meticulous about every commandment 
the light, the light one as well as the weighty ones. However, there is one fault which putrefies the aroma of your integrity and one sin which destroys your good. It seems likely to me that this sin will cause you to lose your place in the world that is forever long and will place you in Tophet, which is prepared for the wicked. Wow. The scholar replied. Well, let's, I think we need to stop for a second. I mean, he's saying, he's telling him, you know, I'm, and this is always the, usually the argument that we like to, uh, uh, to, to take is to say, it's not about the person. It's about the, the their action or their, their faith. So it's, uh, he's saying, no, you're a, a pure person. You're come, you're from the descendant of Aaron. So it means that he's a Cohen. Right, so he's really immersed in uh, Jewish wisdom, but yet he is is exploring, and he's saying he's telling him, um, "You're a good person, but your basically your philosophy is going to bring you to Tophet. Tophet is like Gehenna or something. It's like, it's very uh, yeah, it's very strong um, yeah uh, word. Let's continue. The scholar replied, "O oh, Pietist." how you multiply your words against me in, in your mercy inform me of the sin and if as you say i will confess it after i abandon it and i will beseech you to teach me in what its atonement consists and what the sacrifice is for being committed wantonly and for being committed through error whether a ram or a lamb of the first year are we, are we pausing keep going yeah, well, it were, because he's showing that he's very knowledgeable. He's not, uh, you know, he, he is going so deeply into the law. He's saying whether a ram or a lamb of the first year, meaning because they're offering that you bring a ram and offering that you bring lamb. So he knows the intricacies of the law. So he's, he's showing him that the, 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 when he is immersed in philosophy, in Western philosophy, it does not detract from his knowledge in Judaism. It actually may even uh, add to it. The Pietist replied, I will show you a philosopher. You mix the word, words of the Epicureans and the heretics with the right words of the Torah, and you engage in the study of irreligious books and the compositions of the Greek philosophers. What greater sin could you pursue? The words of all these are a stumbling block to those who read them and a snare. Are they not what makes humans go astray from their God and give uh, the lie to the covenant of the law and cause them to cry out against heaven and to be a heretic? Yeah, so let, let's stop here a second. So um, he's basically saying you're a lamb and you're a, a wolf in, in lamb's uh, uh, skin. He's, he's saying you are, yes, you're using those uh, uh, Jewish terms and you're knowledgeable, but you're mixing it with that, um, you know, the, the uh, um, whatever uh, uh, abomination that then take people away from, uh, from Torah. You're, you're basically leading them. You're putting a, uh, a stumbling block um, in front of a blind person. So, um, by the way, this is the reason that, um, let's say, uh, a Chabad, um, you know, would, would engage, let's say, in, a, um, uh, in bringing closer secular Jews that know nothing, but they will shy away from being, let's say, with a conservative or reform synagogue, because we've made it already a kind of a, um, for us, this is a reality already that we incorporate um, Western philosophy and they, they don't want to deal with that. They want to bring people who are kind of tabula rasa, as we say, they're, they're, they're clean slate and mm -hmm. bring them in. So um, that's you where- We can infect the, the others. Yeah, they can at least affect them. They no, know no, we, they we can, can infect. Oh, them. we can infect them. Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's just just for them. It's not what they do. You know, they want to take and bring people to the what they would consider, you know, a tight uh, definition of of Judaism, and 
you know, we belong to the other camp already. So they can't bring us back. They're just going to uh, take the floating votes. Um, okay, so let's continue. The scholar replied, far be it from me to consider any of their words that go against our Torah, let alone to behave that which contradicts our faith. Rather, I believe of their words, only that which I see to be true and in agreement with our religion. I eat the fruits of the pomegranate and throw away the peel. The pietist replied, this path is not straight for since the philosophers deny the Torah, it is improper to engage in the study of their books or to look into their world, words at all. Right. So one says it's not black or white, and one says it's black or white. So um, I mean, this, this is really the debate of debates. Okay. Um, anybody wants to comment on, on this source before we move to the next? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Alan. I'm sorry. I would just say the one thing. I, I mean, personally, uh, I view the world as uh, all shades of gray. I mean, many, many more than 50 shades. Uh, I don't, I think there's almost no black and white uh, issue in the world um, right. at this point. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I would like, some, some are. I would say some are. <laughs> like punching somebody at the Oscars, I think is, is uh, I'm, I'm clearly on one side. Yeah. I don't have I don't have doubts about the other side. Yeah, Alan. I would liken this to the ultra orthodox community, such as the Hasidics, who take every single word of the Torah literally, and that's why they reject conservatism, they reject uh, reform movements, and and it, just like they in Israel, where those where those. Uh, Thoughts are not even permitted by the ultra orthodox, and the ultra orthodox prevail a lot more in places like Israel than they do here. The beauty. So I would even take that further and say that within those people who we see as dressed all black with black hats and they all look kind of the same, within that community, this is a big, big discussion that has been for centuries. And it's called the Hasidim and the Mitnagdim, the, those who are the Hasid and the Mitnagdim. Now, um, there are Haredi, people who are Haredi that are dressed black and what you said, Alan, fits their um, course by definition, but, but the Hasidim see it also very tight, very tightly in terms of uh, their, the organization of their community. Um, but the big discussion between those two communities is because Hasidim do believe in, um, in, in uh, Kabbalah, in mysticism, and they live off miracles. And the other side of those Vilna, usually tradition that are more scholarly, those who sit and learn at the Beit Midash um, all day, would say, no, we are very rational. We're, you know, uh, mm -hmm. miracles happen, but you're putting it too much, you know, on a, on a pedestal, too much, too high. So um, yes, it's, it's an interesting thing. In Yemen, the same discussion happened with those who followed Maimonides and became uh, what we call derdeim. The, uh, it comes from two words in, in, the, in Hebrew with Yemenite, uh, uh, accent is Dordea. Dordea is the uh, a w wise or enlightened generation. And then there was the Kabbalist in Yemen who fought, and, and these two communities fought to death at times. This is not a uh, simple issue. It's, the, <laughs> it, it's the, the world of miracles and the world of, uh, of rationalization. Um, okay, the, the third um, uh, source, the, the third Hebruta, Anne, you want to call it? Sarah, that? Miriam, Paul. It's like an Aliyah. Ya Amdu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we met. Okay. Um, did you get a chance to read the source on your own? Uh, I was 
starting it. <laughs> yeah. Would you want it? Would you like to uh, read it out loud and then we can uh, discuss it? Okay. Yeah. Maimonides, uh, Judah Al Fahar, letter to David Timmy, uh, circa 1232. He was a leader in the Jewish community of Toledo and physician to Ferdinand III of Castile in Spain. Yeah, so maybe before we continue, um, Maimonides has two um, main bodies of work. It's uh, the, of course, the bigger one, the most amazing uh, codification of the whole Jewish law. I mean, he took this is I bought this when I was in, in uh, rabbinical school. It's uh -huh. the uh, Mishneh Torah. And what he did, he took all the Talmud, all the the nearly 70 um, volumes of the of the uh, Talmud and divided all the conversations there into 14 um, uh, categories. So this is the, he was a genius in, in halakha, in codifying the law. But the other, his other work is more philosophical work. The Guide of the Perplexed um, is, is very philosophical. It's, uh, and when I was in graduate school, I wrote a paper that argues that Maimonides was a, a closeted Kabbalist, that he knew um, you know, everything about Kabbalah, and I'm sure he, of course he did, I'm convinced, I, I wrote the paper, but there are <laughs> evidence, ev evident, there is evidence that he definitely, secretly uh, was a mystic. His son, one of the, one of the, uh, those uh, arguments was that because his son was one of the biggest Kabbalists ever. So, uh, you know, it would be, would, would say that uh, he, he knew both. Because it's very important. Who else was in this um, um, Hebruta? Uh, Miriam and uh, uh, Sarah, I believe. And, and Sarah, okay. So this is a long source, so you can split it, actually. So why don't you start, Paul? And we can... I just cut me off when I... Just give me the sign. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Maimonides says in the Guide of the Perplexed, discussing the eternity of the world, that if he had found in Aristotle a proof for eternity of the world that was cogent according to the rules of logic, he would have been able to reinterpret the verses concerning creation in a matter, in a manner different from their simple meaning, making them fit the doctrine of eternity, i.e. that the world always existed. This would be similar to what he did with the image and likeness in Genesis, which appeared to indicate corporeality of God. According to this approach, wherever a philosophical proof contradicts a biblical verse, we abandon the straightforward meaning of the biblical verse. Okay, so let's stop. Let's stop here and try to unpack this. So, what do you what do you think he's saying here? Is that the 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 if the if logic rules, right? Then um, the ban the the biblical verses are are abandoned if we're doing that straightforward. Well, it, it seems like he he's saying if. Um, the people of logic come up with an explanation for a biblical verse. We reinterpret the biblical verse not to be straightforward, but to um, we. Uh, it's uh, I don't I can't remember the word, but it's it's sort of a it's a it's a wham, it's like a whammy on it. I mean, it's it's in not reality. Yes, you just sort of. Um, I mean, to me, for example, I mean, I don't know if it's relevant, but um, is um, you know the the text we have that says uh, the first commandment: "I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God," mm -hmm. and it's sort of like. 
to be Jewish, you don't have to be anything more than believing in, in that, that God, this, that there's a personal relationship with our people and that we will be saved. Uh, doesn't, you know, there isn't a, you know, we have, you know, we have the other commandments, but basically if you believe, if you believe in that, Mm -hmm. you you are a jew and that's you believe the sinai revelation that's the personal relationship that god is present is actively present in our lives exactly what paul is saying that really what has been defined uh in definitely with maimonides and others as a uh, a threshold so but the question is here is how present is god can you attribute um, uh, anthropomorphic attributes to God? Can you say that when God says the hand of God or this, it's, it's a we taking it literally? So the, the, the argument here is the more philosophical you get, you'll tend to uh, interpret the verses of the, of the Bible as, uh, as allegory. So that's another danger that those responses to him, to, to uh, Maimonides, simply for saying, I'm not saying that the world was always there, but I'm just not saying it is. So, um, you know, for me, I, I could give a personal example with working with, with Christians a lot. I took a, a class at, at YU because I wanted to know exactly the debates between Jews and Christians. And I came out with from this class um, with my resolution to the relationship to my relationship with Christians. Um, clearly, from Jewish the Jewish perspective, God intervenes, and God has a way to to be personal in our lives. So, if God wanted to come it, come into this world as a human being, um, it's it's yes, it God has is it's change in God. But there are other changes in God that, that happened, that occurred, that we believe in. So for me, the understanding was, I can't say that Jesus is divine. It's not, it's like saying the world was always there. I can't say that. There's no, I, 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 there's nothing that tells me that it was. But what I can say is, and basically it's a sim similar argument to what Maimonides is saying, if God who created this world that I believe in, that is all, all encompassing. If he decides to come to this world as a human being, who am I to say that he cannot do that? That's the uh, kind of almost like a uh, somewhere a, a middle ground that we can both live with. So that's where Maimonides wanted to be. And at that time, he was so controversial that you saw that people burned his books. Today, there is not one you know, Jew in this world that doesn't at least respect uh, Maimonides, may not follow everything, but definitely respect him. Okay, um, let's continue. Sarah, you want to continue reading the next two paragraphs? You un unmute? Yes, okay. but clearly, there is no analogy to be made between the doctrine of eternity of the world and the doctrine of corporeality of God. With regard to corporeality, many verses contradict each other. One verse says, and they saw the God of Israel. While another verse says, for humans shall not see me and live. But regarding the doctrine of creation, all the verses bear witness to the same thing, raising their voices in praise of the one who brought the world into being with the divine word. Therefore, a proof from Greek philosophy cannot uproot them. Furthermore, even according to the philosophers themselves, the establishment of a perfect syllogism requires extremely careful investigation. For sometimes something misleading may be incorporated into it, something from the discipline of deception called in Greece, I'm sorry, in Greek, sophistics. The result will be a false conclusion. 
Therefore, we have learned that one cannot fulfill one's obligation by relying on Greek philosophy in matters of the Torah, especially with regard to the proof for eternity, which would undermine the reason for the Sabbath. Maimonides' basic purpose was to refrain from deviating from the natural order of the world because he wanted to make the Torah and Greek science cohabit under one tent. He imagined that they were like two fawns that are twins of a gazelle. But the union is in reality mourning and moaning. The earth cannot bear their dwelling together like sisters. Okay. Um, so what do you get out of that, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> I feared you would ask me that question. <laughs> uh, truthfully, Rabbi, I really don't know. I, I really can't make a choice between am I Aristotelian, am I Maimonidean. I only know what I personally believe, and I guess my beliefs fall somewhere in the middle. Um, the closest that I can come to explain any kind of a belief actually is in agreement with something that you said at one of the services the other night where you said I don't think that I could have accomplished what I have accomplished without some kind of help and that is where I am there are things that I sometimes am able to do things that I am able to accomplish that I think to myself I could not do this by myself. Yeah. And I think that falls somewhere in the middle between uh, the Aristotle and Maimonides. Yes. That's, that's, my, that's my explanation. Yeah. Wow. Very good. Um, Maimonides followed Aristotle in, in so many ways. He, he uh, adopted his views of, of physics of the world and the uh, different philosophies, but um, but yeah, he just didn't agree with him um, right there. I want to I want to say because this is so important what you just said. Um, the this is where the mystery of faith is for Jews, for Christians, for Muslims. It's the same place. It's where we feel that God had revelation in our lives. And when we pray, we want God, God's revelation in this world. It's just that that uh, Christian took it a step further, saying God actually appeared in body. But we ask for God to appear all the time. You know, so it really, that's where it is. It's on the top of Mount Sinai. Do you believe that God was in... Uh, communion with us and that's as far as judaism goes because otherwise there's problematic issues with the physics of of god but we said communion the the hand of moses and god um almost touched there was electricity that went by but they did they could not touch because in the in the infinite cannot be contained in the in the finite, it'll break it. That's why a person cannot see God and live. But he was he was there. Christians took it to not communion, but union, that they did touch. And that's problematic for us. But in terms of where the faith is, it's in that realm always. Yeah, uh, Roberta and uh, Sabrina. Yeah. Um... That last paragraph that Sarah read, um, I really liked it. And it, it seems like in Maimonides' time and in the hundred years following his time, they, they, the people were kind of accusing him of trying to transplant the, the teachings of the Torah with science. And I think that this is really what I, I think is exactly how I feel, that he wanted to make the Torah and Greek science cohabit under one tent and 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 he was doing it like it said somewhere else you know he was doing it applying it without um he's trying to be very without being prejudicial either way 
He was trying to be very, you know, um, unprejudiced about which way it would go. He was yes, looking and at I'll, I'll give you the reference to what you said, the tent, the, the whole idea with uh, enlarging the Jewish tent comes from the, uh, the biblical verse about the son of Noah, uh, Japheth, Yefet, um, that he said, Yaft Elohim le Yefet, uh, God gave a lot of beauty to Yefet, and we kind of attribute Yefet to be the Europeans that with all the beautiful churches and the architecture. Um, but he said, when will you really be um, beautiful? When you dwell in the tents of Shem. It's very important. So that's what Maimonides is trying to do is bring Japheth you can't have, be more Japheth than, than Greece, and bring it into the tent of Shem. If, if it's above the tent of Shem, then that's not okay. But if the beauty and the wisdom and all that, the worldly wisdom comes into the tent of, of Shem, then that's the best combination. And we go by that too. Okay, um, and let's, uh, Miriam, is uh, Miriam, did she, oh, did they leave? Oh, they, they did say they had to leave maybe uh, earlier. Okay, so um, Paul, you wanna finish it up? Uh, sure. Uh, you, David Kimhi, should know that those who walk in darkness, clutching the guide for the perplexed, thinking that they are wise while they despise the word of the Lord and attain little wisdom are indolent and unable to make, true today. Their, to make up their minds. They think that they have the best of both, but in reality, they have neither, neither the light of Torah nor the reputation of true philosophers. You consider the guide to be a wonderful teacher we view it as opening of the door to rebelliousness. So, a gateway, uh, uh, a gateway uh, drug, or uh, or not? I admit, yeah. <laughs> oh, I admit that the guide is not all of one piece. Some of it is pleasant. Some is destructive. Attracted by its good parts, one is seduced by its bad. What did? Would that this book had never come into being, never been translated and never read. The hand of Samuel Ibn Tibon was the first in this treachery. Not knowing what would be its bitter end, he began to be a stumbling block for the people of your country. He gave them the guide as righteousness, Tzedakah, but it turned out to produce an outcry, Tsa'aka. Yeah, Tsa'aka. So he's using his uh, double kind of uh, uh, word play on Tsa'aka and Tsa'aka in, in Hebrew. Um, so um, before we move to the next source, the Ibn Tibon were a family of translators, uh, scribes that, that translated from Arabic to Hebrew. Uh, they uh, so they translated the uh, the first uh, the first time the guide of uh, to the perplex was written in Arabic, so uh, so he was it was translated, um, and basically they're accusing the hand of Samuel Ibn Tibon that even translate they didn't have you know Google Translate somebody had to really translate they knew the inside and out of the of the language, so. Uh, so that was what they were complaining about. And what I want to connect it to, something very important, is that the first translation of the, of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, is the Septuagint. Septuagint comes from 770, seven, the, the translation of the 70 uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Alexandria. The, uh, the king there wanted to, the Greek, uh, one of the Greek kings wanted to, have a full library and he didn't have a translation of the Bible. And he took, this is at least the story, 70 rabbis, 
sat them separately in, in different rooms and mirac somehow miraculously they all came with uh, came up with the same uh, translation. So it was the translation to Greek. So the first translation of the Hebrew Bible was to Greek. Now, the Talmud says when that happened, the, the, the Bible was translated to Greek, a darkness came to the world because of the same argument that now we would give people access that don't know how to interpret it and will incorporate it into different religions and, and faith and so forth. Okay. Um, we'll continue to the uh, fourth uh, source and the next Chabruta, and Yamdu. <coughs> Judy, <laughs> Judy and Suri. Ah, Judy, Suri, and? Adrian, but Adrian, Adrian is gone. Okay, Judy and Suri. Okay, uh, Judy, would you like to read the source? Woe to humanity because of the insult to the Torah, for they have strayed far from it. Its diadem have they taken away, its crown have they removed. Every person with censor in hand offers incense before the Greeks and the Arabs. Like Zimri, they publicly consort with the Mid Midianites and revel in their own filth. They do not prefer the older Jewish teachings, but, but surrender to the newer Greek learning. The prerogatives do their Jewish birthright. They turn not back, but act like strangers to their own teachings. And like satyrs at the head of all the streets, they dance to these foreign ideas and even teach them to their children. Therefore, when we saw, we saw the fowler's snare, even in the remote parts of the earth, and the dove, the Torah, compelled to make her nest in the sides of the pit's mouth, we trembled and said, the disease, heresy, is spreading. So now we have risen and made a covenant with the Lord and the Torah of our God, which we and our ancestors have accepted on Sinai not to let anything alien come among us, nor let the nettle and the thistle, heretical, heretic, heretical ideas spring up in our palaces. Servants are we, servants of the Lord. The Lord, he has made us, we are his. Therefore, we have we decreed and accepted for ourselves and our children and for all those joining us, that for the next 50 years under threat of the ban, no one in our community, unless they be 25 years old, shall study, either in the original language or in the translation, the books which the Greeks have written on religious philosophy and the natural sciences. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> okay. You wanna you wanna switch? Switch. Sure. Right. It is also forbidden for any member of our community to teach any Jew under 25 years of age any of these scientists lest they drag them away from the law of Israel, which is superior to all these teachings. How can a human being not be afraid to judge between the wisdom of human beings who build only on analogy, argument, and guesswork, and the wisdom of the supreme being between whom and us there is hardly any comparison. Can human beings who inhabit but a perishable body think of sitting in judgment on God who created them by saying, God forbid, this God can do and, is, and this God cannot do? This certainly would lead one to complete heresy from this indeed. May every student of the Torah be delivered. We have, however, excluded from this our general prohibition the science of medicine, even though it is one of the natural sciences, because the Torah permits the physician to heal. Over the scroll of the Torah and in the presence of the whole community, we have agreed on the Sabbath of the Torah portion. These are the words, Devarim Deuteronomy 1.1 in the year 5065-1305 to ban these things. Okay. Wow. So there was no law about it before, but they definitely made a definition for their 
community. Um, yeah, so Judy and, and Suri, what do you, uh, how do you uh, feel about this ban? Who's banning it again? It's a community that that bans uh, all the the work. The it's called Sfarim Chitzonim. It's a, a outside sources books that should not be studied. So, so it sounds almost like um, like Brooklyn. I mean, right? <laughs> it, yeah. It's almost like kind of the way I grew up. You know, mm -hmm. like. I mean, seriously, like I ask my nieces or my nephews, for, you know, my brother's family, they don't know any, they don't read secular books. They don't read anything. Yeah, yeah. They only wow. read religious books. Mm -hmm. Or by, you know, like from uh, what's it, Eichler's. Eichler, yeah, I like Yeah, they that. only read books from Eichler's. So there's... Mm. I was, I was, a, I don't, a I don't know. I don't, I don't think you can paint the black hat community with one brush, you know, as Jonathan pointed out, there are all shades of gray in this case, maybe shades of black. And I don't think there's that kind of, from my experience, I don't think there's that kind of uniformity everywhere. There yeah, are pockets okay. of you, uniformity, yeah, but but also in in kind of last uh, I don't know a couple of decades, I would say there's a whole at least in, in Israel as I see it, they do start uh, participating in the market and uh, and go to work and progress mm -hmm. professionally. So, um, but you know, for American Hasidim or Haredi is different because here there's no uh, governmental law that allows them the social <laughs> network, uh, the social, sorry, uh, net that, uh, that they provide for them in Israel. Here, they have to go to work, they have to work. So um, they, they've been incorporated for longer than the Hasidim and the Haredi in, in Israel. Um, yeah, it's, it's a same, same idea, same story of defining the boundaries. Um, I have to say, from my personal experience, I, you know, grew up in that very camp that allowed everything, and I totally lived in, grew up in a Western culture, um, and then really until I went to Jerusalem, and I, I happened to be in that uh, uh, Haredi funeral, I didn't imagine that I'm missing something. You know, I thought, oh, I'm very, uh, you know, culturated. I, I know, you know, different uh, fields and st I'm aware of things. But when I realized that that there does have a price, I wasn't Jewishly connected. I was not at all. So, um, you know, there, it does come with a price. And let's do the, uh, the, the uh, fifth... Uh, um, Source and the fifth uh, Chavruta, the last Chavruta. Not not Roberta, Sabrina, and myself. Okay. Uh, so, Anne, do you want to start reading? <clears throat> we cannot overlook a basic contradiction. The God of the Bible is a person. He is one of the characters who appears in the stories told in the Bible. He has a personality that undergoes development in the course of the story. He creates man with certain expectations, which are apparently disappointed, and he is then sorry that he has created him. He is subject to the emotions of anger and jealousy, among others. He is also filled with burning love, particularly toward Abraham and his descendants. He desires certain things and detests others. He is faithful in the sense of keeping his promises, even when for long periods of time, it seems that he has forgotten them and has no intention of keeping them. Those who trust in him are not disappointed, especially if they are patient. At this stage, our purpose is not to draw any sort of character portrait of God, but to point out that there is 
a personality in the Bible who is God and who interacts with the other characters in the biblical narrative. Against yes. this simple, should I continue? Yeah, or it, means, it means that some things can coincide and some things cannot, cannot interact. Maybe uh, Roberta or Sabrina, you want to read yeah. the rest? You of like, it? yeah, why don't you uh, switch? Okay. Against this simple fact, oh, are, am I muted? No. You're fine. Oh, okay. okay. Against this simple fact, Jewish philosophy has marshaled all of its resources. The personality of God had to be demythologized. How could God have human failings such as emotions, and how could his actions have unexpected, unexpected results? If God could not foresee the consequences of his actions, then he is not omniscient, and a perfect God must be omniscient. The attribution of emotions to God was particularly unacceptable to Maimonides, who is firmly convinced that even properly rational men were ruled exclusively by reason rather than emotion. What was true of philosophers could hardly not be true of God. The biblical portrait of God had to be reinterpreted. The simple human words the Bible attributed to God were to be understood in a sense different from common understanding. Perhaps it was appropriate for common people to take the Bible literally, but it was not appropriate for intellectuals who had to be taught, if they could not figure it out for themselves, that the truth about God was far removed from the simple picture that the common people were offered. Maimonides' full energy is expended on this enterprise of demythologization, thank you, <laughs> of showing that the words of the Bible do not mean what they seem to be saying, but something quite different. Maimonides perfects this deliteralization of the Bible, but he is not, of course, the first to make the attempt. Philo preceded him by many centuries. And gradually the philosophic God comes to permeate Jewish consciousness. The real God whom Adam feared and loved fades to be replaced by a philosophical principle. The real estrangement between God and man has begun. Okay, wow, a very good place to, to conclude here. Uh, I want to conclude with a, just a, um, a minute by saying that if you have a chance to look at the Sidu, our Sidu at page 53, um, these are the 13 principles that uh, Maimonides uh, kind of lays out. And the last thing is you have to believe in the rise of the dead. Mm. So there is no way you can be fully rationalist and believe that. And that is the, that is the mystery mm. of all mysteries. How can God be here and not here, present and not present? Um, Again, this is uh, for Christians, it's the mystery of how can Jesus be human and God at the same time. For us, how can it be that God is removed, is not part of this world, but affects this world, it appears in this world one way or another. So to be Jewish, at the end of the day, you can incorporate the ideas of Japheth, bring Japheth into the tent of, of, uh, of Judaism and learn from them. Um, but you have to be, uh, you have to be truthful to a core principle. And the core principle is that God uh, appears and there are um, instances when God can override uh, nature. So naturally we die. And if we have to believe that God will resurrect the dead, that really is the ultimate faith in those. You know, I, I think it's really important to read Yigdal because it mm -hmm. says what Maimonides believes in his own words. And right. it's, it's mm -hmm. somewhat different from what the critiques are saying what i was trying to say you said it better yeah, yeah i mean god's oneness is unique no other can compare unlimited and boundless is god's majesty no image can be seen no form or body known 
no mortal mind can fathom God's totality. Before creation start, the world as yet unformed, the living God endured in endless mystery and so on. But I think yes. those, you know, it's important to, to, to hear how Maimonides actually thought about God and the world. Right. Yeah, so. I mean, okay. the critiques are often harsh. Yeah. Yes. yes, but, you know, faith is about going beyond certain boundaries. That's what faith is, you know. I, I just want to mention one insight that Anne had when we were studying on with the first paragraph. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the first paragraph, that sentence. Right, let me call you back, okay? Um, where um, it right. says to point out that there is a personality in the Bible who is God and who interacts with the other characters in the biblical narrative. Even though the person writing this um, is coming from like, let's, you know, take the Bible literally. These are words that you would use talking about a novel or, or a, an untrue story, character, right. narrative. So I thought that was very interesting. Yes, yeah. yeah. And it was when, kind of contradictory. Yeah, and when Alan Middleman at the beginning, you know, Dr. Middleman said, what is Judaism? All this, these questions that he brings, uh, you know, is it a community uh, com commitment? Is it uh, faith? Is it to belong? Is it, what is it? And I would say it's all of the above. It's yes. all of the above. That's exactly <laughs> right. what Judaism is. Judaism is all of the above. Mm. And it, what it does in, in our, in the ethics of the fathers and the Mishnah, it says there is no person or thing that doesn't have a time and place. It's just a matter of putting things in time and place. So the three, uh, the three measures, as we call it in, in Hebrew, it's the shiurim, which means also uh, teachings. There are three things, when, where, and how much. And you can incorporate basically almost anything. And that's really the, the wisdom of Judaism, to put it as we go through life, to put these wisdoms where in their time and place and context. Thank you very much, everybody. And yes, you want to? Yes, I want to uh, point everybody towards next week, <clears throat> which is about the Hasidim and the Mitnagdim, <clears throat> which Gadi referenced, uh, I think, more than once today. It's a similar argument, and we've sort of, this whole unit is, the idea is <clears throat> basically the same, law or love. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's those people who say, you know, oh, you're, you're imagining, you're dreaming, you know, how do you think this world progressed? Because of people who dreamt, because of people who believed and, and you know, persevered. So, of course, it's the spirit and those who are very rationalist and want to put everything in boxes um, and limit things. So I'm not saying there's no room for both. You know, we are body and spirit for a reason. So you need to take care of your finances. You need to take care of your food in the refrigerator, but you can't do it without taking care of your soul, your spirit, your faith what wants to go beyond the, you know, the uh, bread and butter. Okay, thank you very much. I'll stop recording here. And, uh, and then we will stop. Okay.